Welcome to this meeting of the Assembly Committee on Education for the 2023 Legislative Session. Secretary, will you please call roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Torres. Here. Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. I am here. We are all present and welcome to this committee. I see a few people here in the audience. Uh, it is uh, National Library Day, so welcome. Um, as many of you may know, I had the um, opportunity to serve on the library district for 11 years in Clark County, and so libraries are very near and dear to my heart and a, a, a big part of of uh, our education system and really important for kids and adults. So thank you for being here. Um, welcome to you all in the audience. We're in the big room, so it's exciting. Uh, also, those of you in Vegas, I see a few of you down there, and then I imagine there's many of you watching along on our YouTube page uh, and listening to over the internet. So just a reminder to silence your devices. I'm doing it right now. Um, and if you wish to testify, please sign in on the table by the door. And if you would be so kind as to provide a business card to our committee secretary. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state and spell your name, any affiliation for the record. Then turn your microphone off each time you're done speaking. We do ask for 20 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to our committee manager by 1.30 p.m. yesterday for members in our committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during this, these meetings. We might not always agree. We know that that might happen today, but we can still be respectful and kind to each other. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Finally, um, we are anticipating some robust conversations, so we're going to go ahead and I, I don't even think we're going to get to 45, but I am going to say we're going to limit the windows to 45 minutes in pro, uh, again, opposition and, um, and neutral. So, and then I don't really like to time people on their testimony, but if you could keep it to two or three minutes, that would be very helpful. Um, with that, let's get started. Today we have one bill, Assembly Bill 175. I'll be presenting uh, AB 75 along with my colleague, Assemblyman Yurek. So I will hand this gavel over to Ch Vice Chair Taylor and we'll begin the hearing. Mm -hmm. Are we ready? Okay, take your time. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 175, and this measure revises provisions governing boards of trustees of school districts. And to present this measure, as you know, we have our esteemed chair, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, and our also esteemed colleague, Assemblyman Yurik. Please go ahead when you're ready, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axelrod, representing Assembly District 34 in Clark County. And I am joined by my colleague, Assemblyman Toby Urich, representing Assembly District 19 in Clark County. We are presenting Assembly Bill 175, which revises provisions governing Board of Trustees and school districts. 
I'd like to begin with some background um, information that exp explains what led to this recommendation and ultimately this bill. There is an ongoing debate on how to stru structure school boards to, the, to best support the work and student outcomes. And let me say that again, best support their work and student outcomes. Student outcomes are paramount. That is the work that the school board should be doing. This issue is one of many studied by the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Education this past interim, which I served as vice chair. To briefly review board government structure, generally the board falls into one of these three structures. Trustees or members who are elected, those who are appointed, or a hybrid of both. Additionally, some states currently allow appoint appointed boards in specific districts. During this previous year, the Interim Education Committee held two meetings dedicated to the study of the composition and selection of the Board of Trustees in the, in, <clears throat> of county school districts. In these meetings, the committee heard recommendations from multiple stakeholders, including members of the community, regarding school board action. These recommendations included mo movement to a hybrid board structure as well as consideration of appointing non-voting members. Um, if you recall, if you, a few of you were on the committee, we had absolutely robust conversations. We had um, one meeting in particular where Chair uh, Dennis actually walked around the meeting with a microphone, let people uh, weigh in. We realize that this is an issue and we want to have this conversation. I'm going to say, is this bill perfect? I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect bill. And if you do, then come to my office and, <laughs> and we can talk because I'd like to know how you can get there. But it's a conversation that we need to have and we need to ha continue to have. What is the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and, and expecting a different result. So given these conversations, it, it's necessary that we further explore what forms our school board might take to examine how other board structures may provide benefits, most importantly, student achievement and outcome. We also would like to see increased professionalism and many more things. The intent of AB 175 is to recommend a new board structure for certain school districts. Now I will re review the specifics of the bill. I would first like to tell you, remind you and remind the public that I will be working off uh, the proposed amendment uh, that I submitted. So this summary will walk through the bill as amended. First, section one of the bill as amended outlines that for county school districts in which the population is more than 75,000 pupils, which includes Clark County School District, the Board of, Sh of Trustees shall be composed of 11 members, including seven, 11, seven elected members and four non-voting appointed members. One appointed member must be appointed by the county commission. The remaining three members must be appointed from each of the three most populated incorporated cities in the county by the governing bodies. I want to point out that number 11. Uh, we are the, the, Clark County in particular is the fifth largest school district in the nation. Um, in comparison, the, our library district, the Las Vegas Clark County li Library District, has 10 members. So currently, uh, the uh, Clark County School Board has six members. Section one also states that for county school districts in which 25,000 to 75,000 pupils are enrolled, which includes Washoe County School District, the Board of Trustees shall be composed of 10 members, including seven elected members and three non-voting appointed members. One appointed member must be appointed by the county commission and the remaining two members must be appointed by each of the two most populated, populous incorporated cities in the county by the governing bodies of the city. For, the, for these counties, the elected members must be elected in election districts established by the Board of County Commissions in the county in which the school district is located. Section one further outlines conditions concerning the election districts, appointments, process, and terms for office. Furthermore, section five specifies that any vacancy occurring among the appointed members of the Board of Trustees must be filled by the appointed authority. The appointee serves the balance of the unexpired term and may be reappointed. 
I will now turn it over to my colleague for additional comments, and then we will stand for questions. Thank you, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod, uh, Vice Chair Taylor, and thank you, members of the Assembly Committee on Education. Uh, for the record, my name is Toby Urich, and I have the privilege of representing Nevada's Assembly District 19. I want to say just a few words on my purpose for bringing this bill forward and my experience in the subject area. First, I want to start off and say I think most of us can agree that there are many strong components in Nevada's educational system. However, I also believe that there are many areas where we can find to improve. Uh, the 2021 Quality Counts Report from Education Week, for example, ranked Nevada 50th out of 50 states and the District of Columbia based on data related to K-12 achievement, school finance, and chance for success. I've had numerous conversations across the state regarding the need for changes that will help make improvement to Nevada's education. The intent of AB 175 is to examine how we can bring about change at a high level through adjustments to county school boards with the sole aim, as my colleague said, to have impacts on our schools and on our students. I want to also speak real briefly on my experience in this area and the benefits that I've seen that comes with the ability to appoint board members. I was the chair of a board of trustees for a small private school, and while I certainly understand that my experiences in that context do differ from the school boards discussed in this bill, I want to speak generally about what the other board members and I found in our work on that board. In our experience, at different times, certain areas of need would arise where we did not have a significant area of expertise. However, we had the ability to seek out individuals with that expertise and add their valuable perspectives to our board. And that contributed very positively to the work that we were able to accomplish. The goal of AB 175 is to provide our school boards with similar capabilities so they can add voices to the board that may broaden the perspectives and expertise of the board as a whole. A mixed school board composed with both voting elected and non-voting appointed officials values the input from both community representation that prompts Nevadans to invest greater interest in their schools, as well as the perspectives of local government bodies who, through their appointments, can bring needed areas of expertise to contribute to the conversations and assist in making the best possible educational decisions. As you know, as originally drafted, AB 175 did alter the balance between elected and appointed members of the board to four elected and three appointed officials. The most vocal concerns that we found raised regarding the structure were that the proposed bifurcation would dilute the voice that comes from elected representation. Recognizing and acknowledging this as a valid concern, the proposed amendment to this bill resolves that issue by retaining the existing seven elected voting members and adding four uh, appointed non-voting members Again, with the goal of adding vision, insight, and expertise to the decision-making process. Admittedly, a school board's success is largely measured by its interest in, enthusiasm for, and commitment to excellence. It's our intention and hope that the addition of non-voting members would enhance the depth and quality of discussion and discourse without compromising the voice of representative democracy. Again, thank you, Vice Chair and Committee, for your time and for your consideration of this bill. And at this point, I believe Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and I would welcome your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Assemblyman uh, Turek. We appreciate your presentation. And we're going to go to questions um, from our colleagues here. And I have a first question from um, Assemblywoman Torres. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, uh, and thank you, Chair Bilbrey Axrod and Assemblyman Yurik for bringing forth this piece of legislation. Uh, obviously, this isn't the first time that we've had this conversation. Um, I know that we had a similar conversation in 2019. I know that we revisited this conversation during the interim of 2021. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be abundantly honest. When we had this conversation in 2019, I don't think I was inclined to support legislation that would have made changes um, to the school board. However, I think that, you know, uh, a lot of the information that we have right now has 
has changed. Um, I think that I have had the opportunity to do more research to see some of the issues that our school boards are experiencing. Um, and one of the things that I think stands out to me is just how large some of our districts are. So can we talk a little bit, and I don't know that you have the numbers right now, but maybe somebody can get it to us. Like what size of budget does the school district specifically looking at CCSD, what, what is the size of that budget in CCSD? And how many constituents is each individual repre uh, representative or trustee there have? Um, because it seems to me that you have a board which is limited to seven members in Southern Nevada that is operating a budget that is extremely large. And I don't even think that we would have a business in the state that would have a board that's quite that small. I don't know if you have any anything to add on that. <laughs> uh, I don't have the information on the size of the budget, um, but I don't know if someone in the audience might or if that's something. Um, but I will definitely, I know it's very large. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know, um, it's not appropriate probably for me to I ask. I was just going to say, may, may, would, would, will we have that staff be able to get that, that budget information? We can we can follow up and get that. We could probably that Google community. it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, your second question was um, the size of each district. So A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and I know they were recently reapportioned. So we probably do have that information, um, and we can probably get that back to you very shortly. That's a great question. And to your point about having this discussion, I too um, wasn't didn't wasn't totally for this at all <laughs> when we first started talking about this. And it's really been quite uh, eye-opening over the past my, this is now my fourth session, um, having these conversations. And honestly, anecdotally, we all have seen some issues that have gone on within the school board in our own district. And um, while I think that members mean well, I do not want to take anything away from those who are elected. I know they're there doing the best they can, but you know, just like the hummingbird, sometimes <laughs> doing the best you can means just dropping a water, drop of water. And so having some additional expertise would very likely help. So thank you for the question. And as soon as we have that information, I'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Just a little, little bit of clarity. So you, you want that information for all of the districts? Assemblywoman Torres? Yeah, I think it would be helpful. I, I imagine some of my colleagues would appreciate it from other districts. I'm mainly focused on CCSD the soonest we can get that. And I know we have representatives from CCSD here um, that should be able to get it for us pretty quickly during this meeting so we can have that conversation. If, if, there, if there is, we would certainly welcome that information on the size. It was the size of each district and the... Will you repeat that, please? Yeah, the size of the districts that the trustees Sh represent. Shannon Bilbray, for the record, CCSD is three and a half billion. A, a dollars in terms of dollars. the size of the budget? Lira. No, dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's yes, okay. do <laughs> dollars. Yes. 300,000 students. But the 300,000 students, and yes. Divided yes. Divided by seven is what I would imagine. Okay, if we have CCSD, right? If you wouldn't mind. Thank you. And then please, of course, you know, identify yourself, spell your name. Certainly. Uh, small chair. Uh, Patricia Haddad, for the record, Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District. I have general numbers. I want to be sure to provide accurate, specific numbers for you. I'm pulling all of that now, so I'll get that over to Committee Secretary momentarily. Um, based on our uh, uh, CCSD quick facts that is available, and I think that uh, was sent out to, to most, if not all, the legislators, uh, we're looking at $3.05 billion. Um, that's on there, uh, but let me uh, circle back with those specific numbers for you. Um, over the past couple of fiscal years, and then I'll also pull those numbers as far as total number of constituents that each trustee is representing currently based on redistricting and reapportionment. Thank you. And, and, and I, I would add, uh, for, because it's as, just as part of the conversation that we, we, we get, gather that information, if there's anyone here from Washoe, <coughs> excuse me, from Washoe can gather that same information. Do you have anyone here from Washington? Okay, so we'll, we'll gather that as well and, and get that sent out to the committee. I also, Shannon Bilbray, for the record, used my calculator to tell you that it's 50,000 if it's equal per. If it's equal per. Roughly. Okay. Roughly. We, we, nothing, nothing personal, but we won't trust her math. We'll get there. Okay, okay. No, no, I'm not okay. God. Okay. Yeah, right. That's only for, yeah, that's right. That's only for students. We're looking at constituents. 
Once again, we will not trust the chairs. Matthew do some things really, really well, but no, no, we, no we'll get those numbers of constituents <laughs> so we can share that uh, for Clark County as well as for Washoe County. Just get it to get it to the committee. Okay, thank you so much. And then we'll go next to Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you for the presentation. And um, I too was on the interim uh, um, education committee. And I do remember um, Chair Dennis uh, going around asking these very important questions. And um, it was, like you said, a robust conversation because of um, some of the actions that we've seen at the school boards. But I have actually two questions, and it's relating to the non-voting members. I want to know, um, number one, how will they be selected? And number two, uh, what value will they be able to bring to the board that these voting members will value? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Thomas. Uh, through you, Chair, or Jewish, can oh, I go Oh, please, directly. Okay. Uh, Assemblywoman Thomas. So um, I specifically in my conceptual amendment kept that pretty vague. And the reason, that, first of all, it, it'll be done by the county commission and then the three largest cities in Clark County and the two largest cities, which are currently Reno and Sparks in Washoe and then our uh, city of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas and Henderson in CCSD. Um, but as I was saying, I, I specifically kept it vague because I anticipate that the issues that we are having right now might not be the same issues that we have in 10, 15, 20 years. So my idea was to give some levity to that to the, to the commission or the cities to appoint someone who brought, um, who brought expertise in the area that was needed at that time. Um, that could look like, like I said, always, always student achievement and outcome being the paramount above all else. But whether it is budgetary issues, whether it is, you know, I mean, there, there's a multitude of things. So that's why the, the language was left intentionally vague. Um, you know, we're up here in Carson City, and I think, one of the very first things I learned uh, my freshman year was um, when you put people into a box and what they can do, um, people don't like that. <laughs> they like to have um, a broader base. They, you, they too were elected, right? Um, and so giving them um, that ability to seek what is most important for their city or their county, what they believe, what that expert will bring. Does that make sense? Do you want to add anything? Yes, it does. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yeah, can I just add real quick, I, I want to reiterate and kind of clarify that point that uh, at least in my thoughts of, of heading, because right, it's a valid question. By the way, Toby York, for the record. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman, for the question. Um, if they don't vote, what value do they add, right? And so that, that's a very legitimate question, and it's quite frankly why I assume that it was broken up with four and three as originally presented so that there was equal voting power. Uh, but there were legitimate concerns that came as a result of that, and that's the best part about this process is hearing different ideas and thoughts. And so the idea of still adding these individuals without voting power is to give them a seat at the table, right? And so we've got the various entities, whether it's the county commission or the municipalities, with their perspectives on what the challenges are on the board from their uh, their base, their constituency's perspective, and then they can identify an individual and appoint an individual to the board that might be able to speak um, from an area of experience or training or expertise to hopefully elevate the discussion and engage in dialogue that ultimately they don't get to vote on, but at least it would bring more voices to the table, encourage high level dialogue, and hopefully result in better decisions. And thank you for that explanation. And if I could, um, Madam Vice Chair, mm -hmm, please. Mm -hmm. follow up. Just follow up, how many other states, or have you um, looked at that? How many other states have this model? Um, we, 
when we were doing our initial... I'm so sorry, oh. Madam Chair. State your name for the <laughs> record. I'm sorry. Assemblywoman Bill Bray <laughs> Axelrod, for the record. I'm, follow, I'm, I'm following <laughs> your example. <laughs> You're right. Okay, thank you. You're right. Do as I say, not as I do. Okay, right? sorry. Don't fire um, me. Yes, yeah, so we looked at um, many, many different hybrids, both the... Um, the fully elected, hybrid, appointed. We did not look at this specific um, sort of ad hoc membership. Um, it was something that really came um, after the joint committee had already, we had already put in our recommendations, but we continue, I continued, and I know Assemblyman Urich continued to have these conversations with people. And overwhelmingly, what we were getting was that people did not want that elected aspect to t be taken away, and I think we all respect that. So um, I will get that information back. This was a conceptual amendment that was that we created just very recently. Thank you, Assemblywoman Thomas. Next, we have Assemblywoman uh, Larue Hatch. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, as a teacher in one of these affected districts, you can imagine I have several questions. I value you both as colleagues and I believe you have our best interests of our kids at heart, but I am deeply concerned by many things in this proposal. Uh, one of them is that in Washoe County, which is included in this bill, our board is functional. Its functionality is in fact increasing, and I think it is because of democracy that it is increasingly functional, because our voters rejected extremism in our last election, and we have a board that is working. And so I would just like to know why Washoe is being included in what seems like mostly a Clark County issue. Well, my, uh, my statement would be that I don't think that, ha uh, Shannon Bilbray Axelrod for the record, <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do it again. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think having additional expertise and additional voices at the table is ever a bad thing. Um, and so that's that would be my statement. Would you like to? Yeah, I, I kind of had this reserved for later, uh, but, uh, you know, the idea that uh, I believe. Name, please. I'm sorry. It's a bad example. <laughs> You've trained me well. You've trained me well. <laughs> Toby Yurick, for the record, thank you uh, for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the, it's the old adage, right? I think democracy best flourishes when there are more voices that can be heard. And um, I think that bringing people with certain levels of experience to contribute to the dialogue, obviously there is a point that you reach at diminished returns, too many chefs in the kitchen, can be a problem. We don't think that in, with uh, respect to the size of these school districts that the additional three or, or four board members non-voting contributing to the dialogue with particular areas of expertise uh, would do anything but help those boards. Yeah, please go ahead. So my follow-up to that is then, if we are talking about voices in the room adding experts, then it shouldn't matter the size of the district. So why is this not also being applied to the rural districts? Uh, Toby Yurick, for the record, thank you, uh, Assemblywoman, for the question. Um, I, I will tell you that that is something that we are still open to, and I'd like to reiterate that uh, both Chair Bil Bilbrey Axelrod and myself are still open to speaking with stakeholders and constituents to try to further evolve this piece, this bill, to try to bring forward the best legislation possible. Um, and that is one of the, the issues that did come. Should it uh, be equally applicable where we can add one or two members from smaller districts? The, the challenge is that, you know, they don't, you've got one county, maybe you don't have municipalities in there with their own authorities to appoint certain levels, right? So it was more based on the size of the, the population and the number of municipalities that are in these respective counties that would might otherwise benefit fit from contributing to that school board and bringing, giving their municipality an opportunity to appoint somebody to speak from their perspective on issues that are important to them. So it was kind of scaled in that regard, not with any intention to exclude smaller school districts. And certainly we would be open to having those conversations as well. And, and to that end, um, perhaps we could think about, as Shannon Bilbray Axrod, for the record, having permissive language to allow, I know that um, some of the smaller they've rebranded frontier counties, um, have some issues with finding people, quite frankly. Um, so I think um, my colleague is 
Assemblywoman Hansen is nodding her head. So that's it, that, you know, so we, we want to be mindful of that as well. So that was why they weren't initially, but perhaps we could put, I would be amendable to putting in some permissive language to um, include them. No, no, you go right, go ahead. Go ahead. I told you I have, I have several. I know. Um, so, so my next question then is, I agree with you on getting more voices in the room. I have long advocated for having non-voting students and non-voting educators on these boards. And so I, I would like to know if you are open to that rather than just a general anybody. Um, my concern is if we are just asking the city councils or the county commissioners to appoint their friends, then we get some random business person or lawyer who maybe has no relation to the schools, no idea what's going on in our school districts. I don't see how that adds value, but if we were to specify that we have to have a teacher or an education support professional or a student, then I could see that value that you are speaking to, especially in regard to student outcomes. Shannon Bilbury Axrod for the record, and I'd be willing to, to continue to work with you the, on this. The, my concern initially, and this is just, I'm kind of speaking off the top of my head, is that then, so you're putting in teacher, am I making the county commission appoint the teacher? Am I telling, is it a rotating thing? So maybe the county commission does it, then the city does it in North Las Vegas does it the next time. And then, or do, or would you be amendable, which I have, wouldn't have a problem giving some examples. Um, but I, I think this, the, these can be conversations that, that we can have, but as always with this legislation, the devil's always in the details, right? So um, we want this, ideally, we're trying to um, bring more expertise. So the intent of this bill, what we are trying to do is not to have, you know, Bob's paving president, you know, who has nothing else to do. There's no Bob's paving, by the way, so I just made that up. If there is, I didn't mean you. Um, you know, who has nothing else to do and he's retired and so his county commissioner says, you know, I'm gonna appoint you, that'll be fun. That's not the intent of this bill. The intent of the bill is to bring industry, or not industry, education leaders in to help move the conversation and improve student outcomes. And, and I'm Toby York for the record. Um, thank you for that. I think there's a legitimate concern there, right? Could this just become another way for people to appoint their friends? And, and you, you specifically said that. And I think I would just try to point to the fact that, you know, there is a, a accountability from the electeds through their constituency that are going to be reflected by the people that they appoint to these boards. So they will be accountable to their voters as well. And so that is kind of hope that there is some accountability there that when these entities uh, uh, make their appointments that their voters will hold them accountable for those appointments and to whether or not the people that they are appointing are making any meaningful contributions to the school board and its decisions. Okay, I was going to say, give you one, my more last one. And, and, yeah, one more and then you'll, the, you can follow yes. up. And, and then I'll follow up. That, that just leads, I think, perfectly into my last question, which is we know that our city councils and our county commissions are not free of dysfunction, are not free of uh, these political games. And I just would like to know why we believe that they will be more accountable to the voters and they will do a better job of making these maps and making these decisions than the school board trustees who are also accountable to voters. So how are they different? One is being held accountable by, by voters and the other one is not. Toby, for the record, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that the intention here, right, is to give that governing body, the county commissioners, the, uh, the city council members that represent that municipality, they are ideally going to be appointing people from that are going to meet the needs or interests that that governing body has an interest in, that they see there is a need on the school board from the perspective of our city they will look at that and go, we need somebody to speak in on that board on this issue that's important to us as a community. And so, uh, you know, again, I, I will go back to, to what my colleague said. They're, they're, we're not 
presenting this like this is a perfect solution that is foolproof and devoid of any potential challenges. Uh, what we're trying to do is figure out ways that we can identify individuals and have those individuals appointed to the board to elevate the discussion, to try to identify better solutions to the challenges that we know face these school boards. And so uh, my point isn't that they're going to have the perfect appointment every time, but uh, that they are not without a check and balance as well with their voters. So the idea is that that collective group of individuals individuals might be in a position to represent the needs or the perceived needs of that community and to make their appointments based on that accountable to their voters. Thank you, Assemblywoman. We're, we're going on to uh, Assemblywoman Hardy. Um, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you both for taking this on. Um, I too was on the Interim Education Committee and as you said, this has been addressed multiple times. Um, having been born and raised in Clark County, attending Clark County schools, you know, and had seen over the decades um, the problems and challenges that have developed and um, the years that we have been dealing with this. And as you mentioned, the goal, I think, of everyone is the student outcomes and achievement and, and how can we best um, make progress in that. And so um, I appreciate you doing this and I appreciate all of the work that has gone into this, um, people that are, are participating in this. And so I, this may be just a, a question to sit on, um, which is if progress and improvement is the goal in student outcomes, is that happening if we continue with the status quo? And I will speak for you know Clark County School District since that's where what I represent and where I, again, grew up as well as my daughters. So if we continue as we are, you know, how long do we stay in the status quo and expect change? Um, so then I, I know I have and probably many of us on the committee have gotten numerous emails. A lot of them were sent before the amendment went out, didn't like the reducing the number of elected members, et cetera. So, and I think you've addressed this a lot of, these appointed members are non-voting. Um, a lot of these emails are, well, how then are they accountable to the voters? And I think, you know, in your answers, you have addressed that. Um, if there's anything else you could say to, you know, these people that have been emailing with that concern, uh, maybe you can address that. Or um, I see some of these appointees as to, you know, who they would be. It was mentioned the budget, the size of Clark County. You know, maybe it would be somebody that has um, expertise in large budgets. And this is not to disparage or anybody that's on a school board. You know, all of us that serve in this legislature, we have certain areas of expertise, um, our careers, and we bring all that to this group. And so that, the, that's what I see as this bill is, is the appointed members is bringing um, other ideas and other um, expertise to a group that maybe these people just, it's not saying anything negative about them, it's just saying that they haven't dealt in this. and so. Again, it's to help the student outcomes. And so if you can address any of the concerns that we've received in the emails, just to get them on the record of what this bill is doing, what these appointed members are doing or not doing, how they're held accountable. And if that is what you intend with the appointed members, you know, that they maybe they're accountants or they're lawyers when they need legal guidance, people that work in education, is that kind of how you see or hope that the appointees um, would be selected. Thank you. I'll start out a little bit and then I will turn it over to my, my colleague. Uh, first answer is um, the first question you asked, do we expect outcomes to change based on what we're doing? And the answer is no. We've, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. It just doesn't work. Um, education is one of those things um, that sort of everyone feels like they're a subject matter expert because we all went to school. Um, 
And there's nothing wrong with that. We all have our own experience. We have shared experience with other colleagues who have had similar experiences. But when you're actually dealing with student outcome, it goes so much deeper than that. And so that, that is the intent of this bill, absolutely, to bring in someone who really can take a deep dive into the budget and see where those dollars are going. I mean, that number is, is so huge that, you know, it's more money than any of us, you know, would ever see. So, and this is the budget. This is what they're dealing with. And, and God, God love our school board members. I, I mean it. Anybody who decides to put their name on a ballot um, and, you know, puts themselves out there, uh, there's this, you know, I have a special place in my heart for those people because it is very thankless 90% of the time. And so I don't mean to take away anything from those folks. I think they think they're doing the right thing. I think that sometimes it's a little misguided, and maybe it's misguided because they don't know that they don't know. So once again, the intent of the bill is to bring those subject matter experts, true subject matter experts on different areas of education to improve student outcome. Would you like to... Sure, Toby York for the record. Um, I really appreciate the, the question and the point that was being made there, uh, Assemblywoman. The, oh, I can't say my name. <laughs> the, <laughs> the choice to do nothing is a choice to retain and maintain the status quo, which I think through my limited experience on the campaign trail, limited time in this building, is not something that our constituents want. We cannot guarantee that this is the be all end all. This, there's no one solution to the challenges that we're experiencing in Nevada's education. This is one attempt to try and contribute to a solution. And so, yes, I, I do believe that if we chose not to act, we're, we're actually making a choice to not change anything. We're maintaining the status quo. Um, and then as to the other question, I, I will go back to what I alluded in my opening remarks, that it was largely based on my experience, N certainly nothing. I, I will tell you, I've been so impressed with the individuals, very passionate about this topic for all of the right reasons, with good intentions, trying to bring solutions to help our students. Um, and everybody has an opinion and thought of how that should be. Uh, and then you get elected and now you are in a position to try to offer something. And it definitely brings people out. And I will tell you, I am not offended by it. I don't question people's motives. I think that everybody has a heart to do what's right here and help our students. And so when we say making these appointments with individuals with particular areas of expertise, I, I go back to my experience on the private board I alluded to earlier. And that is, it was no offense to any of the other board members. We just recognized that we lacked a certain perspective on that board. And we believe that these governments governing bodies who have a vested interest in educational success in their communities will be able, it will be in a position to identify those areas of need, identify individuals that can then make a difference or offer a voice and a perspective on those issues and contribute to the dialogue that they don't get to vote on, but at least can raise these issues and ideas to elevate the discussion and help the voting board members make best decisions possible. And if I may say one more thing, Shannon Bilbrey axwed for the record, look at what we do in this building. I mean, look how many people we turn to for additional expertise. When we come up here, we have that ability. People are in the building. We can talk to them. There are, you know, bills that we're all voting on that are not in our wheelhouse at all. We don't just like close our eyes and press the button. We we go to the person who has that information and that's at our at our fingertips here. So really that is the once again the intent of this is to give people that ability to have those subject matter experts at their fingertips and and once again as my colleague said elevate that conversation. Thank you for both of your explanations. Okay, thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy. We're gonna go now to Assemblywoman Mosca. 
Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you for this. There are obviously two sides, and I appreciate the amendment, which I believe is trying to find a middle. Um, my experience has been on a state board that was all appointed, and we all had different expertise that worked fine. Um, my question was really around in your intent and what you all are thinking when it comes to quorum, as well as uh, open public meeting, or public open meeting law. Uh, we know that if the four are the voting, then that would probably be the quorum, but do you think, how, what are you all thinking around the appointed members talking beforehand or just what are, what are you all thinking about that? Shannon Bilbray Axelrod for my, the record. So um, open meeting law is obviously something that needs to be considered, but you can, as a, um, a member of a board, talk one-on-one -on -one with someone uh, from here. It's just when it gets to a number that, uh, it goes in defiance of open meeting law. So I, I think quorum would be the same as it currently is. So they are all members, so the quorum would be the same. Um, we intend that they would be attending meetings. So that's if, if um, the appointed members are not attending meetings, that's something that we would have to deal with. But um, I do think um, open meeting law would allow for um, individual members to speak one-on-one. -on -one. That is allowed under open meeting, and so Big fan of open meeting law. Definitely has some challenges at times, but um, you know, I think daylight is a great sanitizer of the whole process. So you know, um, as you know, uh, that's how I run my my meetings. I try to get information out as soon as I have it. Um, I don't think that. Um, you know, backroom deals are 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 do are good for democracy, and so I think once again the intent is if you want to have, but most of these conversations really should be happening um, on the dais. They should be ha happening with people seeing them, with people watching, um, and elevating that conversation. Well, good. Thank, thank you, Assemblywoman Mosca. Okay, Assembly been calling. So, quick sidebar on open meeting, it's pretty difficult when you're a county commissioner where there's three of you and you can't talk to the other guys ever except in the open meeting, but anyways. Um, school board's kind of my thing. I, I did school board for 12 years and I was part of the Nevada Association of School Boards. In fact, I was even president of that. Um, so, I think school boards are near and dear to my heart. In fact, Simon Yurick asked me what I thought about his bill before the amendment, and I gave him three words. I said, I hate it. Um, but now I've looked at the amendment, and I, I, I don't hate it as much. Um, you know, like I said, I was, I was president of NASB, and my comments will probably get me, myself kicked off of the alumni dinners, but they don't have those, so we're good. Yeah. Um, but I do have some questions. The first question I have is, and you hit on a little bit, but I want a little more in depth of how do you envision the role of the, the three or four appointed people? You said they should be at every meeting. Are they supposed to be there for every grievance hearing, for every contract negotiation with every union? Are they truly going to be a part of the board as much as the seven elected just don't have a vote? Or do you say you're accounting person is going to come in on budgets, but if we're talking about expelling a kid for bringing a squirt gun to school, are they need to be, I mean, are they, are they truly going to be part of the board or are they going to be advisors? I think we need to, that needs to be clarified to me. Yes, Toby York for the record. Thank you, Assemblyman, for the question. Um, yes, the intention behind this amendment was to give these appointed members full authority and role as governing board members, uh, trustees, absent the ability to push green or red, to make their final vote heard, and to, so that we limit right the, the potential dilution of representative democracy there. Uh, but making sure that these individuals that were appointed by the governing entities do have a voice 
at every other, in every other situation and context at the other board members where they would be. Um, of course, subject to open meeting laws and all of that. Uh, so yes, the, 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 the intention here of this amendment is to have these appointed members be full-fledged trustees minus the authority to vote. May I have one more? Go ahead, quickly. So yeah, lot of, lot I'll, I'll try to go quick. Uh, you know, Assemblyman, Assemblywoman down the road a minute ago said, you know, Washoe County is really, uh, is really functioning now. But well, f when I was first on the school board, Churchill was about as functional as possible. And when I was board president, this is, I think, right before this chairwoman Taylor got on, Washoe was a train wreck. So it cycles. And now I haven't been paying cl close enough as attention lately, but it sounds like Clark is having a lot of issues. So, I mean, I'm looking at this as just more, just help. Let's bring in some help. They're not, they can't vote, but we're going to str strenuously argue against having some people come in and potentially offer help. My last thing is, why not the rurals? Like I said, I was in Churchill, and it was a train wreck. We were a mess. We could have used in another advisor to come in and maybe give us another opinion, maybe just add one, one more to the rural, someone to come in and help. But you're offering this resource and this help to the, to the big counties, and now all the little counties are I guess we're going to make people mad. We might as well make everybody mad. <laughs> but um, if, it, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. If it's important that the big counties have someone come and help them, the little counties need that also. So that's my question. Why did, why, yeah, why not consider maybe offering some of the rural some help too? Thank you, Assemblyman Conan. Shannon Bilber axwed for the record. Are you not doing the rebranding where we call them frontier counties? Because I think that's really cool. No way. I want to be rural. Okay. <laughs> Wait, All right. Then we, we'll uh, stick with rural. I, 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 think, <laughs> I think some of my counties probably fit frontier just fine, but we're not a mining. We're a farming. Oh. So... All right. Frontiers of the mining counties, <laughs> not the farming counties. Touche. All right. I, I got it. So um, I have no problem including uh, Shannon Bilber axrod for the record, uh, the rural and frontier counties. Um, as I mentioned, I thought it, it, from what my feedback was, was that sometimes it's hard enough to find people to run for the actual seat and then find someone to serve. So I think... Um, we once again we could put in that language, but then I think we might have to add some language that it would not count against the quorum if that position wasn't filled or something like that, because that that is my concern that has been stated to me. So, um, but I I appreciate your comments, and I hope not everyone hates it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll continue on, and we will go to uh, Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, again, distinguished colleagues, for your great presentation and your uh, great insight and for presenting this bill. So uh, I'm, I'm a city boy, like, all the ways. Uh, I, I went to school in Clark County. I teach there. So my focus is really going to be on Clark County. Now, this is a uh, district that has 325,000 students, 18,000 teachers, 40,000 staff, Altogether, I think the number is about what three to three and a half billion dollar budget, and it is in one of the fastest growing uh, urban metro areas in in the country. And and the, and I think this is really important too when we talk about who's making these uh, these appointments now to this uh, this hybrid board that we're discussing here. Uh, there's so much talk of connecting education to the economy. If you if you want to look at economic growth, diversifying the economy over the next uh, decade, and and beyond. Uh, education has to be a foundation of that. And I think that there is great merit, uh, great uh, sort of potential now of bringing those factors into the, uh, the decision making of our, of our school boards. You know, I myself have seen, uh, you know, in Clark County at least, just so much uh, inaction, so much dysfunction. And uh, my, school, my, my, my students bring this up to me. They're saying they're over there literally cussing at each other. You know, so this is something that has to be addressed. And I think that in order for us to uh, uh, see our students succeed, we need to make sure that our trustees are in a position to be successful. And this is going to require uh, bringing some sort of expertise to the table. So I just wanted to go ahead and put that on the record, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Mr. Silva. And I believe our, our, our last question, I think, is we have, we have others. Last question coming from Assemblywoman uh, Anderson. 
I'm sorry. Oh, we have a couple down here too. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Okay, go right ahead. Thank you. And um, thank you, Vice Chair Taylor. And thank you, Chair uh, Bill Reaxrod, as well as Assemblymember York. Your first bill, way to, way to put on the armor on that one. Whew. Um, I think my first bill might have been like a, a license plate or something, but way to jump into the, into the fire pit. Um, actually, I have three questions. And so do you want them rapid fire or do you want them individually? Okay. The first one has to do with the, is there anything to stop a board from doing this on their own? Um, as uh, I think uh, Vice Chair Taylor has mentioned, we have in Washoe a student that is a, that is a member, that is a non-voting member, and I hope one day that we can get a teacher on there as well in that same area. So is there anything to stop a board from doing this if they wish to do so? My second question has to do with the training. Um, as was mentioned from my colleague from Clark County, there are some actions, and also from uh, no longer the frontier uh, the rural county, I think, um, there are some actions of uh, some board members which are creating frustrations, which is, I think, where this bill is coming from. Uh, so what is the training that would be required, not only of the appointed, but also the mandatory training of the trustees that are elected to make sure that they are, in fact, embracing the SEL, which we are celebrating this week? And then finally, um, I guess, what would be the process of drawing those lines? When we draw the lines for the trustees, that's done by a commissioner. And when we draw the lines for the legislature, that's done by the, again, a group of individuals. So what would be the process of drawing the lines of those appointments? Uh, would it just be a city council that gets to make a decision? Would it be a county commission? Um, I realize this is in the, the weeds, but quite frankly, the devil is sometimes in the details. Thank you. Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbrey Axelrod, I'll correct you, the devil's always in the details. So um, the intent of the bill is that the entire county commission would appoint um, one of the, position, one of the uh, appointed positions, and then each city within those city um, boundaries would be the others. Um, as for the training, I think you we are going to see a bill that deals directly with um, school board governance and training. Um, I know it's being currently worked on, but we anticipate that that a bill will be making it over uh, to our side, um, which I think is extremely important and um, an overlying um, thing that I've felt as being chair of education that we can't expect people to not know what they don't know, right? So, um, I mean, just as legislators, think about when we came in and we all, a lot of us probably thought we knew what we were doing and then we went through our training and went, wow, we have a lot to learn. So um, I think uh, supporting our trustees and giving them every opportunity to succeed, we can't, we can't keep, we can't keep electing folks, not giving them the tools that they need, and then being mad at them for not succeeding. I mean, that, what good is that doing anyone? So I think um, you will, I don't think this bill will necessarily address the training aspect, but we will see another bill, and it is extremely important to me. And I, I mean it, I, I, I intend to help shepherd that through. Um, the last question was, uh, is there anything to stop a board from doing this? I was not aware that Washoe did that. I would think that typically, and maybe this might be a question for legal, but I would think that it, we would have to give permission to do this. Um, that's typically how the legislature works. But Mr. Killian, if chair, vice chair, if you don't mind that I'm. That would be f fantastic to have a legal opinion on that. Thank you, Madam Chair, Asher Killian, Committee Council. Um, so generally, the membership of boards of trustees um, and the number of trustees that are allowed to serve um, are defined by law in Chapter 386 of NRS. But um, NRS, NRS 386-350 gives boards of trustees general powers as may be requisite to, attend, to attain the ends for which the public schools are established and to promote the welfare of school children. Um, so I'm not familiar with the Washoe County School District situation in particular, but it might be a reasonable reading of that power, um, which also allows boards of trustees to appoint people like attorneys and other staff that are necessary for them to carry out their duties, um, to also allow for 
pupils or teachers to regularly attend meetings to advise the board in a similar fashion. So I think that's a possible reading of that section. I don't know that that was necessarily the intended purpose of that section, but um, if Washoe County School District has been creative in um, making that reading of that section, it's not prohibited by law. It's just not also not required. And Sh Shannon Bill Bray X wrote for the record, and I also want to say that you talked about um, the what the maps looked like, what the and so that that's also laid out in this, and so that was an important aspect that we had those municipalities at the table because, as my colleague mentioned, um, perhaps the city of Henderson might want to appoint um, someone with a specific area of expertise that is a different area of expertise than the city of North Las Vegas based on what their population is seeing. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification on the maps and who to go to. And then also thank you for the, for the legal language around there because I think that that is something um, that helps tremendously. Because uh, my last little follow-up is, is there anything to stop or uh, maybe as maybe instead of encouragement between the school district from working with the cities and counties that the school district is currently part of like for example is there already a plan um, that a school district or county might might uh, decide that they will have a monthly meeting to go over these items with the leadership of the two items I realize that neither of you might have that information but if there's a possibility from the, the two large school districts if when they do, if they do decide to come up to testify, if they could possibly mention if there's a monthly regularly scheduled meeting to discuss these items, because I think that's where part of this frustration is coming from. And I might be mis misstated, but I didn't know if you guys wanted to comment on that one as well. Okay, okay, they got nothing, so okay. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you for that information. Thank you. I just just, uh, be just before I go to uh, Assemblywoman Hanson, a follow-up on that. So in terms of the lines in the districts, based upon the amendment, the seven lines, the lines for those seven districts that are already drawn in Clark and in Washington would not change. That really had to do with those appointees from those. Okay, thank you. I thought that was it. I wanted to get the clarification. Shannon Bilber Axrod, for the record, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And thank you for being here. I think you're so brave. Um, I, uh, to my colleague, uh, Assemblyman De Silva, um, I mean, I think maybe it wasn't you that said it, but somebody said, wow, your first bill out of the chute is um, taking on this subject. You're in good company. My very first bill in 2019 was taking on HOAs. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I admire you both for taking this on. Being part of that interim uh, education committee, having been here when we uh, heard the hybrid school board bill in 2021, um, I, I had consistent concerns across the board that I was very um, transparent about and had good engagement. I appreciate that you have done a yeoman's work to really work this. I know you're trying to find a solution. Um, I want to put on the record, um, and I think I've discussed this a little bit with, uh, with you, Assemblyman Murek, that I, and I think as, uh, Chairman's familiar with this because she served with me long enough, one of my concerns is while I think we're trying to find a solution in good faith, the solution is not gonna solve personalities. And our disruptions in school board meetings will sometimes come from personalities as electeds or personalities of citizens. And, and yet that can be a frustrating thing, but I don't know that the, that will fix this, but I am glad that we addressed training because that did come up in the interim. And I think that's a component that I was stunned the minimal amount of training that's required for, for elected school board members. So that certainly needs to be addressed and increased. Um, and then when we talk about this advisory non-voting, which I, I love that idea, but can I have examples, and I'm not saying that you're gonna have these, so perhaps those in the audience, what are some examples of problems that have been there that an ad hoc, uh, uh, some, 
professional, somebody with maybe some experience is going to be able to solve. So I'd maybe in testimony, if somebody could address that, if you don't have one off the top of your head, um, because I know here with us, we, d we deal, we're a lay legislature, right? We're a citizen legislature. We deal with billions of dollars in state budget and in education, and we rely on our staff. But if I'm not mistaken, I think school districts have their CFOs, they have their attorneys, um, and they've got that support. So I just need to be convinced a little bit stronger. What do these other ad hoc, if I'm using the right word, bring, these appointees bring that the district doesn't already supply them in, in through their school district? Uh, Toby York, for the record, thank you, Assemblywoman, for the question. And I, uh, as you've indicated, we have had these conversations. And quite frankly, the, the proposed amendment here comes as a result of a lot of these conversations. And I, I want to reiterate what the Assemblywoman said earlier, and that is that what is happening now is not functioning as well as we would like it to function. And I wanna reiterate, this is not an attack on those people that are working hard, trying to do the best that they can to get the outcomes and better outcomes and achievement results for our students. Um, but we know that a decision not to at least try something at this point is a decision to choose the status quo. And that is really what's motivating this. And so I, I'll reiterate that this is a human business, and anytime human and their individual personalities are involved, I don't think that there's any solution that we could offer uh, that is going to solve that problem. Uh, again, the aim of AB 175 here is to bring individuals with a needed area of expertise as it is perceived by the local governing entities, as I've already indicated, have a vested interest in a good school student outcome uh, to appoint individuals to the board uh, that the assembly mentioned as well, maybe unique to that jurisdiction and some economic growth potential or opportunities that they have that they think that might be considered on the board of trustees. Uh, so it, it's bringing those people uh, with that specialized area of expertise um, and interest to have a voice at the table. And so your point is well taken. There are resources that are available to the existing boards of trustees. Uh, the difference, we think, between what is existing there now and what our uh, proposed amendment offers is that this allows those individuals a seat at the table. It's not just a resource that can be sought out and questioned, but it actually allows in the public meetings and in front of everybody a voice at the table. Uh, and so we think that is the line of delineation here that makes this a little bit different. Uh, but again, keeping in mind and respecting the valid concerns of representative democracy and not allowing that to dilute the otherwise democratic voice. Please well, go ahead. And then, and then we'll go to Assemblywoman Torres. No, no, um, after I'm, somebody with hands to follow up, then we'll go to you. Okay, thank, um, you. thank you for that. And, and again, um, I'm, I'm here being open. I, I really want to try to find a solution with you as well. Um, when, oh, it, it was brought up um, about personalities, and I too don't, I mean, no offense by that. We're dealing with human beings, and when we can even see things, it, we, we need decorum. We need to really get back to some decorum. My own opinion about why I think we see a breakdown, though, because I have been involved in, in, in school boards clear back in the 80s. Where I think I've seen a breakdown is when we talk about a voice at the table, I think the frustration, whether it be from the members on the board or the, the public at large, they need to have a voice at the table in the sense that, and this is just a suggestion for, for school boards, do we find a way to bring the public in and validate their voice in in more of a collaborative sort of area, rather than it's us against them, um, where you know we collaborate quite well with our constituency, with with other members here. Is there a way to bring um, the public in in little subcommittees, in, and maybe they already do that? I've been out; uh, my kids have graduated, and I unfortunately I haven't been as involved as I should. But I just think we need to work on giving a voice to that frustration. Um, people need to learn how to voice their 
opinions better um, and since not take it out on those who have stepped up to the plate to run for office on school boards. So I think there's a lot of work in the training, in helping the public feel more engaged, um, just food for thought as I'm thinking out loud, which can be dangerous. So thank you so much for taking this on and, and helping us understand it better. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Hanson. Assemblywoman Torres. Thank you, and this will be really quick because I know that there was a conversation earlier about ensuring that the, there was a diversity of the non-voting members that would make sense to the needs of the board. And I know in previous um, sessions when we have conversations about what like that commission looks like or who the commission can appoint, it might be helpful to include like a list of like individuals or like that would be a, a, like possible candidates for this um, to kind of outline that specificity. I don't know that it's necessary, but I think it might be helpful to get to the intent, right? It, I don't think that we want the county to just appoint, you know, a random person. I think we want the county to appoint somebody that, you know, understands big budgets or education, uh, CFOs, you know, whatever that is with those different experience. You know, industry might want somebody that understands business, economic development that might be in there. So I think it, it might be helpful to kind of include that in there somewhere. Thank you for the for the comment, uh, Assemblywoman Torres, Shannon Bilbrex, for, for the record. I actually had that in my notes, um, trying to kind of come up with when uh, Assemblywoman um, LaRue Hatch brought that up, you know, maybe putting um, not a completely inclusive list, right? We're not going to, because we can't, but just giving some ideas which would lay out really the intent of the bill, um, it would be very clear. Um, so I'm, I had made that note. So thank you for, for um, reminding me to bring it up. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll have just a couple of questions on my own, and then we'll go to testimony. Uh, a couple, these are a couple of questions that I've received that I think you'll, you'll want to get some responses. On the record, or consider it as we look for, for moving forward. One is there's nothing in the bill. It says they can be reappointed, but it doesn't say how long they can be reappointed for, or can they be appointed and then serve and serve and serve and serve? Um, or is there some kind of limitation to that that you, that you have in mind? Shannon Bilberry asks, Rod, for the record, the, the intent of the bill would be that it would be the same term limits as the school board. Okay, so they have, th thank you very much. Secondly, um, any, any consideration to because their, their role would be so, this is my question, so, um, so much in alignment with the elected uh, members, that's the intention, everything other than the vote, right? One's getting paid, one isn't. I any consideration to what that might feel like for that appointed member who's doing the same thing, spending the same time, and they're going to want to visit schools and go to activities because they're going to want to be informed, I would imagine, and then not get paid. Assemblywoman Bill Brax read for the record, and um, I know what we get paid, which is like nothing, but I, and I know they get paid even less, I believe, yeah, right? It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty close to nothing. So it's not like they're going to be fighting over a million dollars. I want to say it's... It's, it's $9,000 a year. It's, it's $9,000 $9, a year. $9,000 a year. Yeah. Um, it is not our intent to have those members be paid. Um, I... That's not our intent, but we can have that discussion, but that is not our intent. Oh, yeah, I, and please, I, w I wasn't making the recommendation. I was saying if they're doing the exact same thing, you know, that could create create something. Assemblyman Turk? Yes, Toby York for the record. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, the, it is, there's nothing that mandates that an individual accept their appointment, so they would be accepting the appointment with the understanding that they are not getting additional compensation for it. And as we've already indicated, I don't think anybody's coming to these positions to uh, for the pay. Uh, so the idea is that uh, these local entities that would make these appointments would identify individuals with a heart for students with a particular area of expertise that would be willing to come in uh, for nothing and serve the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, this is something I think that question I got several times that you may want to put the response for on the record because of the, the additional voices um, that, that were mentioned. It wasn't said in that way anyway. Why not the same uh, recommendation for city councils and county commissions? Toby York, for the record, uh, Vice Chair, um, I, I will, <laughs> my colleague just indicated, I, I agree. That, that, that's not something that we really um, 
considered because we were truly focused here on the challenges that we're seeing in education uh, and brought this uh, bill forward to address those issues. If there are other issues and troubles that belie our uh, county commissions and uh, city councils, certainly I would uh, think that maybe they might bring forward some uh, bills to address legislatively the challenges that they're experiencing. So this was limited to school boards. So I'm, unfortunately, I don't have anything on to add to that. Shannon Bilbrey Axrod for the record, and, and that would not be in purview of this committee. Thank you very much. Before we go to testimony, we, do, we did get some information, and Alex is going to put that on the record for us, regarding population numbers for each of the districts within the Clark County School District. So that, since that was asked about specifically, we're, we're also going to be looking for those numbers uh, for Washoe as well. But if you would put that on the record, that'd be great. Thank you, Vice Chair. Alex Drozdoff, uh, Research Division, Legislative Council Bureau for the record. Uh, so the total populations provided by Clark County School District for District A is approximately 324,000, District B approximately 319,000, District C approximately 324,000, District D approximately 329,000, District E approximately 319,000, District F, approximately 324,000, and District G, approximately 324,000, for a total of approximately 2.2 million. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go to, to testimony um, now, and we will be looking for um, uh, testimony in each of three categories. Testimony provided in, uh, in person in Carson, uh, via teleconference from Las Vegas, or over the phone. And again, um, as a reminder, testimony in support, opposition, and neutral will be limited to 45 minutes for each category. And then any further instructions for providing testimony on the bill can be found on the agenda. Each person has three minutes, as the chair spoke earlier. She really hates to limit that to three minutes, but I have strict instructions, and so I am following uh, following those instructions, but we do want to hear from, from all of those who have taken the time to come out um, here in person, in particular, or call in or, or in Carson. And I know there are a couple of uh, um, assembly people that have had a couple of other questions, but I wanted to get to, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to get back to those, but I really wanted to get to the testimony um, for those who've come out. So please, as a reminder, state your name and spell it for the record. And remember, uh, we, have, we, we want to keep this short if we can. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N, the Senior Vice President and Government Affairs for the Vegas Chamber. First, I'd like to thank the bill sponsors for bringing the bill forward for the committee's consideration today. The Vegas Chamber is in support of AB 175 as introduced and along with the proposed amendment by Chair Axel, Axel Bilbray. This work has also resolved the, of those, the, also has re resolved the work that was undertaken by Senate Nevada Forum. As many of you know, the Senate Nevada Forum was a collaborative effort that was established by this chamber, the city of Las Vegas, uh, business organizations, community leaders, and concerned citizens. And this was part of the process also in the interim period to, to discuss education issues that were important to the residents of Southern Nevada. It's a transparent and collaborative uh, approach that we have adopted since 2011 in our community. Um, in regards to AB 175, it's a direct result of the collaborative work that has been done by our stakeholders in our community and the residents of Southern Nevada. This is being driven by a desire to see greater accountability by our community on decisions made by our local school boards. There needs to be a stronger community engagement, commitment, and leadership for our school board to be successful for the benefit of our students. The reality is the existing governance model has not been effective for many years. It's not been a one-off, but an ongoing situation in our community. It has been rift with internal struggles and a loss of faith by community members and the business community. That is why the Chamber believes it is appropriate that Clark County, Henderson, North Las Vegas, and Las Vegas have a direct representation to the school board. These cities represent minority populations and diverse communities that they need to have a voice in our local school board. It is our belief that, there, that these reforms need to happen now for the sake of the over 300,000 students that are enrolled in the Clark County School District. And this bill is about student achievement and success. The business community, as you know, are, are, are the future employers of these students. Our business community pays significant taxes to fund education, and they are vested stakeholders in our community with their support also with local schools. In regards to the question about expertise, these school board members that are appointed from our local jurisdictions would bring expertise in financial management, land use, construction, building maintenance, food services, purchasing, leadership development, partnership and collaboration building, and communication. 
That is why we believe that this bill is vital to our community and to move our education forward for the, for the sake of our students, not just today, but our future generations. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you so much. Who's next? Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. I'd like to thank the sponsors for these bill, this bill going forward because this is a forward-thinking way of- I'm, I'm so uh, sorry to interrupt. If oh, you'll give us your name, state your name you and spell it for the so, record, please. You are so right, and I know better. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. <laughs> Liz McMiniman, Retail Association in Nevada, M-A-C-M-E-N-A-M-I-N. Um, and I do know better. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, and that was one of the things that I was going to point out. For over 20 years now, um, I've been listening to these conversations about education in, in the state of Nevada. And we, we just have abysmal outcomes going on for so very, very long. And when um, the chair, chairwoman said something about the definition of insanity, I thought, she's absolutely right. We keep doing the same thing over and over and again, over and over, expecting different results, and we have not gotten them. And looking at this bill and reading this going forward, this, this is one solution that possibly could bring some, as they said, expertise and professional experience to these school boards out there to help these children, because that's what this is about. This is about educating our children to be prepared for the workforce. And our members at the Retail Association of Nevada are looking forward to an educated workforce in our state. And as we grow, we, we are feeling those pains of what we haven't addressed over the, the previous years. So I support, Re Retail Association in Nevada supports this measure. We look forward to working with the sponsors on this bill. We thank the chamber and, and everyone else involved that's come forward. And we, we hope that this is one of the solutions going forward to help our children as, so they can be successful in, in this future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. Who's next? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. Isaac Hardy representing Council for a Better Nevada. We are in support of AB 175 as amended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hardy. I should also include that. I'll take the words of Assemblywoman Peters, a good ditto. Is, is very very well uh, appreciated, and uh, well, we know we we're going to have a, a long hearing. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Nicole Rourke, representing the city of Henderson. Um, the city of Henderson supports AB 175. Appointing school board members can provide greater accountability to parents and the community. The city council receives numerous constituent concerns regarding our education system with no direct means to address them. By appointing a school, a school board member, municipalities can ensure that leaders of the school districts have the experience necessary to guide such a large organization and be responsive to parents and families. There are many school boards across the country that have authorized some or all members to be appointed. According to Education Commission of the States, these states include Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Virginia. Several large school districts have appointed or mixed boards, including Boston Public Schools, New York City, whose 13-member board is entirely appointed with eight members selected by the mayor and the remaining five seats filled by each borough's president. And New Jersey has also long provided for mayoral appointment of school board members. Additionally, five out of 10 school districts with the largest per pupil spending have appointed school board members according to a 2020 research paper on the topic by University of Nevada, Las Vegas student, Yanel Yamas. Our schools and our community need strong leadership at the school board level. At no time in our at no time has this ever been more evident than now. These last few years have presented unprecedented challenges for every organization, and working with our regional partners has been essential to providing the leadership and support needed by our community. We have seen the amazing work that can be accomplished in our community through true collaboration, hard work, and mutual respect. Schools are the cornerstones of our communities, and our kids deserve nothing less than professional leaders prepared to take on our greatest challenges. We look forward to the opportunity to appoint a board member to the CCSD uh, Board of School Trustees who will raise the level of accountability, professionalism, and collaboration, as well as bring the expertise required to make crucial decisions for an organization with a $3 billion operating budget and a capital program in excess of $4 billion. 
The city supports appointed members with full voting rights. However, if this committee chooses to adopt the amendment presented by the sponsors, we would like to see language that specifically grants them the same rights and responsibilities as their voting counterparts. This includes, but is not limited to, the ability to add items to the agenda, participate in closed door sessions, evaluate the superintendent, and participate in all briefings. Thank you for allowing me to express the City of Henderson's support for this bill, and I assure you that our council will take this appointment very seriously and look at the experience necessary to be added to the school board for success in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Schwark. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Taylor and members of the, co of the Committee on Education. It's great to be back. Uh, this is my first time this session. For the record, Leonardo Benavides, Governor Affairs Manager for the City of North Las Vegas. I just want to echo the sentiments from the City of Henderson. We appreciate the bill sponsors for amending this to include the City of North Las Vegas. It's very important to have a conduit to the school board in real time and have a seat at the table, especially for our communities of color, which have suffered through a lot, especially these last few years coming out of COVID and a lot of disparities that we see in education. So thank you so much for your time, and we're glad to support it. Thank you, Mr. Benavides. Anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in support? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas? I don't see anyone coming forward. So we'll go ahead to, is there someone coming forward? Oh, there we are. I'm sorry. Almost cut you off. Thank you, sir, for being here. You will have three minutes. And as a reminder, please state and spell your name for the record. I think we know, but let's go ahead and do it anyway. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair Taylor and members of the Assembly Education Committee. My name is John Velardita. I'm the Executive Director of the Clark County Education Association. So I just want <clears throat> to share a few comments. First and foremost, this is really... I think intended to improve the governance model of school districts, and I'm just gonna speak in relation to Clark County School District because I'm very familiar with it. What I think is very useful with this appointment process, and this is a compromise for those that have issues with you know, taking away the, the right of the community to vote for their elected school board trustees, it essentially does two things by involving the local municipalities. One, uh, they then have skin in the game in terms of our education delivery system. And two, I think, and this is what I would ask the committee to consider, you know, our education delivery system is an integral part of the economy. And if we're not producing students to be the workforce for tomorrow, we're never going to improve that economy. Clark County, the city of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, and Henderson, all of those entities are very much preoccupied and proactive in trying to develop their economies down there. And they all recognize and uh, the, the need to have a robust uh, workforce so that they can attract new industries. So in that context, I think that they're going to be very much vested in this process to bring support and assistance to the school board elected trustees. After all, this is about making outcomes successful. And in this case, it's student outcomes and student outcomes that are successful improve workforce development. Real briefly, I think this is long overdue. In 2015, there was a bill in the legislature to try to improve student outcomes by reorganizing the school district and have a decentralized model where the hub of delivery was the school. School trustees balked, threatened to go to court. In 2017, AB 469 had to be adopted by the legislature to try to improve the delivery system. In 2019, Speaker Frierson worked with us on AB 309 to find local revenue to fund pre-K activity because pre-K is so foundational for a kid's education. There was a meeting with the county commission and the school board trustees. Nothing was worked out. The school board trustees balked at the idea of having additional funding to improve student outcomes around pre-K. During the COVID experience, the city of Henderson, North Las Vegas, the county in particular, as well as Henderson, all stepped up to try to provide learning opportunities Mr. during the moment uh, when it was Mr. Valadita, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, sir. Your time is up. Can you wrap that up? 
No, uh, thank you. I'm sorry I went over. I, I support AB uh, 175 with the amendment as proposed, as well as some of the critical comments that people made to improve it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are more comments you have written, you can submit them to the staff there, and we can make sure we get them to the committee. Is anyone else there in Las Vegas who would like to speak in support, in support of the bill? Okay. Uh, BPS, we're going to go to the phones. Do we have anyone who's phoned in who would like to speak in support of AB 175? To testify in support of AB 175, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to provide testimony in support at this time. Okay, thank you so much, BPS. We're going to now turn to anyone here in Las Vegas who would, who would like to testify in opposition. I'm, I'm sorry, in Carson, not here in Las Vegas, here in Carson, here, here in Carson, here in Carson, who would like to testify uh, in opposition to AB 175. As a reminder, we'll have a 45-minute uh, period of time for all the, of the opposition testimony, and you'll be limited to three minutes each. And we appreciate that. And as a reminder, please state your name and spell it for the record. And whomever's first, you can go ahead and begin when you'd like. Good afternoon, um, Vice Chair and Committee. My name is Lynn Chapman, and I'm representing the, uh, I'm the State Treasurer of the Independent American Party. And uh, we oppose AB 175. I'm from Washoe County, by the way. Um, our school boards in Washoe County and in Clark County are very important to the citizens. It's the government that's closest to the people. The school board controls the school's policies and budgets and oversees academic, legal, and financial health of the school district. They hire and evaluate the district superintendents, resolve conflicts, and allocate funds. They represent the public interest and serve the diverse values and the needs of their community. The people need to see high academic standards, transparency, and accountability from our school board. We, the people, want what is best for our children and our families. Making the decisions for our community is important to us and using our right as citizens to be able to vote for people to work in our favor is of utmost importance to us. The amendment that was proposed includes the intent which states the elected positions would still be elected but that three positions in Washoe and four in Clark would be non-elected positions and advisory only and not voting. Uh, I believe we already have attorneys that are present for legal advice. Uh, if there are other expertise and professional experience needed, I know the expertise and professionals professional experience can be obtained only when needed so that why don't you have the professional sit with the parents who are uh, experts and professionals as well and give uh, information that is needed at that time. Um, we appreciate the amendment, which we feel is a significant improvement over the original bill, but we feel the additional appointees are not really needed uh, on the board. Um, and I just wanted to say also thank you, Chairwoman, for having the meeting in this, this meeting room because the chairs are really nice for us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Chapman. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Alan Munson. I'm from Sparks, uh, Washoe County. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, I am uh, really heartbroken. <laughs> I'm, I'm opposing the bill, or I would oppose the bill, but the heartbrokenness is that every one of us here is concerned about solving a very serious problem, and I support 100% doing that, and I know each one of you is concerned with that. Um, some of, you know, some of my concerns uh, are just, uh, as as a uh, previous spoker sa spokeswoman said that uh, uh, you know there is the needed expertise can be achieved or invited or other ways might be um, 
uh, facilitated to deal with the problem. I think the attorney uh, uh, council spoke to, like in Washoe County, where they do have some volunteers or people who can come on and speak. Um, and there's just a lot of questions that I would have as to, you know, what what is the expertise? What is the problem that we need to solve by bringing in, you know, it's been mentioned, budgetary. Well, don't we have uh, 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 CPAs or people on, uh, you know, in their school districts that are dealing with the finances? And we know there's some issues. Uh, uh, I, this may be inappropriate, and I apologize for it. In my first career, I, I was a social worker, and I had a master's, a master's degree, an MSW, in social work, and that was human problems and, and trying to solve it. And I've learned today uh, that the biggest problem we're dealing with is student achievement. And, you know, as I, as I was hearing, I was thinking, um, to achieve something, we need discipline. I, I try to learn a, a new, uh, as a retired person, I try to learn a new uh, gift. And I have to, pra I play music. And I have to practice every day. And I have to be disciplined. So if that's a big issue in our school systems, and we're not um, uh, uh, having rules, and if I'm, if I'm speaking too long, shut me up. But if, if we have, um, uh, uh, rules and structures, I think that's fallen down a little bit in our school systems. I see here teachers are assaulted and teachers are not respected. And we've got to bring that, I think, we've got to bring that back. And, and that doesn't need, an, a, you know, a giant expertise. That need, That's bringing back discipline in our school systems. I, so, I'm so sorry, Mr. Munson, but your time. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you all for what you're doing. We appreciate your coming. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and the committee, uh, Vice Chair Taylor. Uh, my name is Ron Miranda. I'm also from Washoe County. I'm a precinct captain, 7416. Um, I oppose this bill. Assembly Bill 175 is an affront to voters who elected our school board trustees. The attempt to appoint additional members, uh, whether they're permitted to vote or not, uh, to these elected positions shows a blatant distrust of the competency of our elected school board trustees and voting public of Nevada. Um, adding insult is the compensation of proposed unelected consultants, and no one works for free. I don't believe that one. Um, hard are, they're paid by the hard-earned taxes of Nevada and voters, federal or local, paid out in compensa compensation and benefits, <clears throat> excuse me, why would this additional tax money needlessly be forced on to the hardworking taxpayer? This is taxation without representation. You know, if we're intent or the bill is to get a consultant, then if you're looking at Clark County and it's $3.2 billion, maybe you need a consultant there. Uh, if, you, if you're intent on that, uh, we passed around Albert Einstein's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity. But then again, when you look at corporate America and how we've done uh, pay for performance and efficiency, Lee Iacocca with Chrysler back in the, gosh, I think that was the 70s, and corporate reorgs, maybe they do need a consultant cut out the fat. I feel a little bit upset when they uh, talk about teachers and all the staff that are doing the hard work, but obviously we might have a problem at the upper levels, right? So maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we need to look at that and uh, quit throwing money at problems. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Please go ahead. Madam Chair, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. And I'm actually going to be brief in these comments. 
Uh, NSCA appreciates the conceptual amendment to preserve school boards as democratically elected bodies. We seek a further amendment to include educator voice on school boards by lifting the prohibition on service by active educators from the district and by requiring at least one appointed non-voting member to be an active educator. We've consistently advocated for the inclusion of educator voice in the decisions that impact us. Preventing active educators from participating on their school boards takes away one of the most important and knowledgeable stakeholder voices from these deliberative bodies. NSCA believes incorporating educator voice onto school boards would go a long way to increase the professionalism, productivity, and standing of our county school boards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Who's next? Please go ahead. My name is Laurel Crossman, C-R-O-S-S-M-A-N, and I am a school board member in Carson City. I have been on the board for the last 10 years. This is my 11th year. I'm not speaking on behalf of my district, but as an individual. And one of I appreciate the effort that we have to improve student outcomes in the state. That's something that we have all been working for. My question is, well, before I get to that, I also appreciate the preservation of the elected members of the board because the elected members are accountable to their communities. Um, my question is that this amendment to include appointed advisors is based on the presumption that student achievement and outcomes will improve if we have these appointed advisors. And what I'd like you to look into is, where is there any data to support that? What evidence is there that that will actually improve? Because there could be as much of a hindrance by adding additional advisors with no voting. Um, there's talk, and I understand that we want more representation on school boards. We want everyone to have their voice. Um, my concern with having these appointed representatives be from the other government entities is that there's more likely to be partisan appointments. Um, school boards function as nonpartisan entities. In my last 10, in 10 years, I have rarely known the political affiliation of my fellow board members because we make decisions based on what is best for students, which is not a party specific matter. Um, in the last couple of years, I've seen extreme partisan politics entering into school boards. Um, and I would hope that we can avoid that in the future. Um, and just the other final thing is, um, I'm, I'm concerned about what accountability non-voting um, advisors to the board would have. And I would, I would just let you know, too, that school districts do have advisors. They have financial advisors, we have presentations on everything we can ask questions before, um, and there's there's quite a bit of information that goes into the decision. And school board members that I've met across the state in the last 10 years have come from a wide variety. We have engineers, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have principals, we have other community members. They are um, committed to improving outcomes for students. So if, if, if there's any documentation that student achievement will actually benefit from these advisors, I'd, I'd hope that you can supply that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crossman. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Marie Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. And I am opposed to Assembly Bill 175, and I'm here as a citizen of Washoe County. My only child is grown, so why does this bill interest me? <laughs> well, one reason is that AB 175 does not offer a clear explanation for the proposed change, and it is a significant change, and this to me is a great concern. It's somewhat vague. Um, it sounds like they're asking for consultant expertise, but specifically in what areas? And if appointed with an inab inability to vote, well, they're kind of tying their hands in a way anyway. If an area of expertise is needed and they want board members with this expertise, why not seek out such persons and suggest they run and get voted in? That seems to be very simple to me. Each seat of every school board trustee in Nevada should continue to be decided by election. With the election process, the citizens of each district are offered an opportunity to get to know the candidates and choose who they want to represent the best interest of the school staff and children. Our future parents, doctors, educators, civic leaders, scientists, public servants, artists and athletes and business owners are the school students today. They are our future adults and they will have an impact on our society in a few more years. And our public schools are directly connected to Nevada's future. 
During this past election, I had coworkers and friends with school-aged children comment on how unconcerned they were with who the school board candidates were because their own children are either homeschooled or in private schools. And this is wrong thinking. This is where we need the change with our voters because whether these kids attend public schools or not, their future still depends on the kids who are in public schools. And I think it's important that several of our newer school board, school board members here in Washoe County actually have children in the public school system. That tells me that their interest in what is best for our schools is a personal commitment. We must have a voice. Do not allow this bill to take away our choice of representation. First school board members, and what next? Appointment by outside offices for city council members? Where would that stop? Our 32nd president, Franklin D. Roosevelt said, Nobody will ever deprive the American people of the right to vote except the American people themselves. And the only way they could do this is by not voting. Don't allow AB 175 to prove former President Roosevelt wrong. Allow all trustee seats to continue to be in elected position. Talking of the status quo, let's change it with the voice of the voters. This is what we did with the Washoe election. Thank you so much, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you uh, so much. I'm used to calling you uh, uh, President Taylor, but I will say Vice Chair Taylor and members of the committee for the record. Dylan Shaver here today on behalf of the Washoe County School District. I do have a little bit of housekeeping to take care of at the front. Uh, you had asked for data on uh, the district itself. The budget comes in at about $1.1 billion worth of total expenditure on a student population of uh, just shy of 62,000. Uh, there are seven trustees and 30,600 voters in Washoe County right now. Now those trustees would each represent districts of about 60,000 in size because there are two districts that are sort of at large and represented by larger segments of the city. So uh, those would of course have, have larger representation. So I, uh, uh, you asked for data and here I am. Uh, now on with the show. Uh, I have never met Trustee Crossman before uh, today and actually still haven't met now. She was just sitting sort of two seats away from me for the first time. Uh, what was amazingly impressive about her though was that she took my notes without looking at them and then said them to you. So. Uh, uh, but for the fact that I get paid by the word, I would say ditto. Nevertheless, uh, <laughs> uh, two things that, that I really wanted to bring up. One, there was a lot of discussion about accountability today, about dist uh, uh, municipalities having, quote, skin in the game. Uh, I'm not sure how adding appointed non-voting members on behalf of, of a municipal voluntarily organized corporation creates more accountability. Uh, I, if this bill were to expand the number of seats so that districts would be smaller or something like that, I, I can sort of see how you get there. Uh, but the accountability in, in, in place, I guess, would be to the voting majority of a school board or county commission and I can tell you, uh, some of you have been here long enough to remember, I had a major hand in running one of the large cities of this state for a short period of time. Uh, I, I don't think we do ourselves any service by grossly overestimating the amount of thought that goes into those appointments. And we can leave that at that. Uh, the other piece uh, 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 the, the uh, Trustee Crossman brought up that I thought I was very clever for coming up with, but again, she read my mind, is these are nonpartisan boards. Your county commissions in this state are not. They are partisan entities. If we look at Washoe County in 2022, we could say sometimes they are fiercely partisan entities. If you look at Clark County, however, that county commission is dominated primarily, my understanding is, by one political party. Uh, and so giving them sort of an appointment sort of just adds the din of partisan politics to a place where heretofore it, it really hasn't belonged. Uh, that is no disrespect. You're elected on a partisan level. I vote on a partisan basis much of the time. But uh, when we sit down and have meetings at the school board, I think you all said it best when you said it is about the kids. I know it is dicey 
for a school district to weigh in on uh, the way, the manner in which we are governed. Ultimately, this is your policy decision. Nevertheless, we do have real concerns with this bill. We look forward to working with the sponsor and uh, co-sponsor on hopefully sorting through those and coming back here with uh, uh, something a little more helpful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Shaver. Is there anyone else here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition to AB 175? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go to Las Vegas. I see someone sitting there. If there's anyone else there in, in the house who would like to testify in opposition, please come to the uh, table at this time, and we will go right here. We have one person there ready to go, and so we are ready for you. Please, as a reminder, state your name and uh, spell it for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair and committee members. My name is, for the record, my name is Evelyn Garcia Morales, E-V-E-L-Y-N-G-A-R-C-I-A-M-O-R-A-L-E-S. I'm the president of the Clark County School District Board of Trustees, and I'm here representing the Nevada Association of School Boards in opposition of AB 175 and its amendment. Three years ago, I filed to become a school board trustee. At that time, I remember looking at the state of education with a special focus on student outcomes and wondering what else could I do to improve our students' outcomes. So I asked myself back then, why not me? I really saw an opportunity to make a change that could move a district in a positive direction. And so I took that responsibility to heart, and I have. Over the last two years, uh, which I've had the privilege to serve on the school board, I've, uh, this position has humbled me in many different ways. And I'm so grateful to the people who have elected me to serve in that capacity. But I know that the challenges that the Clark County School District experience are uh, un universal across our entire state. And the reason why I'm here today to talk about this in support, in, excuse me, in opposition is for three reasons, three reasons according, uh, with the support of the Nevada Association of School Boards. We talk about the importance of student outcomes. It is our number one priority. And to some degree, at some point, uh, a member of the public shared that, excuse me, um, a member uh, of the committee mentioned that personalities uh, are, are challenges sometimes in any elected body. I want you to know that these items, when it comes to um, focusing on student outcomes, the priority for school boards is to focus on board governance so that we are able to move personalities aside. It can cause a real disruption if uh, we are not focused on student outcomes. Now, the other piece that I think it's important to mention that has not been mentioned already is that there really is, at this time, we have not seen any effective local government examples that model of this model that demonstrate, for example, uh, excuse me, this model is only demonstrated for state regulatory agencies such as the State Board of Education. Now, the State Board of Education is not similar to the school board. We do not oversee schools, collective bargaining agreements, or multi-million dollar budgets. For these reasons, we have to continue to trust our voters and the democratic process to elect their local representatives on school boards. And really, any effort to dilute an elected body with an appointed member or uh, a consultant distances voters and their representatives. And I wonder today, still, um, what else can I do to support student outcomes to address the real pain that exists in our community, in our education system at, at the state level? And for me, it's focusing on student outcomes through strong board governance. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Your timing, I was just about to ask you to wrap up. So thank you so much, Ms. Garcia, Macias. Thank you for being here. I mean, Morales, please, excuse me. Is there anyone else there in, in Las Vegas who would like to testify in opposition? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go to BPS. BPS, is there anyone on the phone line who would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 175? To testify in opposition, to bill AB 175, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, my name is Lorena Cardenas with my Children's Advocate and I oppose AB 175. What a way to further cut parents out of the equation. I think we can all agree that any action our legislators take 
on education should be solely for the purpose of improving education for improved outcomes. How does this bill do that? By robbing parents of their voice? School board members were not meant to be experienced with degrees or certificates. They were meant to be seats filled by a person chosen by taxpayers who are funding them to represent them for in their child's education. We're getting numerous messages in our group from parents who are utterly disgusted by this violation of their democracy. Shame on representatives Derek and Bill Bray for sponsoring this. This bill is a slap in the face to taxpaying citizens. We don't send you to our capital so you can come up with ideas to silence us. To trustee Evelyn Morales, I know we don't always see eye to eye, but thank you for being there. And I really wish that we had more trustees that were concerned in their hearts. Uh, the concern in their hearts was to see our children do better in education. It says a lot that she's actually there in person. And I just encourage all our representatives to vote no on this bill because it really is an attempt to silence us even further. Thank you. Thank you, caller. BPS, is there anyone else? Uh, pardon me, is this about uh, education? Uh, y y yes, it is. This is the Assembly Education Committee. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Uh, we'd like to thank the sponsors for bringing this very important issue, and I understand we need restructuring, and in some ways this does help. Uh, but I am in opposition simply because this does not really solve the problem. Uh, I do not believe in people being appointed uh, rather than by county or cities. I believe the real solution is we have to add more trustees because there's one trustee for like every, I don't know, 300,000 people. That's what really needs to be done. This is a very local issue. In fact, I wanted to also point out that the real issue is that the, the Clark County Commission, which, you know, I have concerns about, and to be honest with you, the real solution is to consider uh, not only adding more county commissioners, maybe even consider breaking up Clark County, which may likely result in the school district being broken up. For an example, I think we can have Henderson as being its own independent city, and when you have an independent city like Clark County, or Carson City, excuse me, then what happens is that they can handle their school matters a lot more effectively. That's the way I really see how it should be done. Because honestly, I think the real issue when it comes to local matters is that we have too much central control. We have a monopoly of the Clark County Commission. This is a problem because in this massive population growth that we've experienced in the last several decades, we've failed to update our boundaries and our structure. So while this is a step forward, this does not solve the heart of the problem. So either change some parts of the bill or do not support this at all. Thank you. Thank you, caller. BPS, is there... Um is there anyone else on the line wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 175? Hello, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. For the record, my name is Alida Benson, A-L-I-D-A-B-E-N-S-O-N, Executive Director of the Nevada Republican Party, testifying in opposition to AB 175 on behalf of the Nevada Republican Party. As parents have woken up to the disaster that comprises public education in Nevada, where only 4% of children test proficient in mathematics, they've become more involved in school boards to drive accountability and transparency for our school districts. Sadly, this bill is an attack on those Nevada parents fighting for better schools for their children by attempting to remove accountability from our school boards by stuffing them with teacher union-friendly appointees who are hostile to common sense reforms. This bill is also anti this bill also is opposed to the values espoused by the platform of the Republican Party, which states, our public education system needs substantial improvement. We support local control of public education with the money following the child, 
giving parents and guardians more options in school choice. Parents and guardians should be able to choose between public, charter, private schools, or homeschooling as the best option for their children. What is the goal of this bill? Less accountability? Less responsiveness to voters and constituents? This would remove stakeholders in the education system who at least have some incentive to care as they have an election and replace them with unaccountable appointees representing interests that do not advocate in the best interests of families and children. We are also opposed to the Assemblywoman's Amendment. We need less government appointees at every level. We need parents' voices advocating for their children to be amplified and encouraged to run for school board and be part of the process of improving student outcomes and cutting bloated salaries like Jesus Jara's in Clark County School District and returning that money to educators. On behalf of all Republicans in the great state of Nevada, we oppose Assembly Bill 175. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Benson. Are there any other callers? BPS? Chair, there are no more callers wishing to provide testimony in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you so much. We'll now turn our attention back here to Carson City and anyone here who would like to testify neutral, neutral to Assembly Bill 175, come forward at this time. Okay, seeing none, we will go to Las Vegas. Is there anyone there in Vegas? I see someone there at the table to testify neutral on Assembly Bill 175. And thank you. We're going to go to you. Just as a reminder, please uh, state your name and spell it for the record, please. Yes, my name is Sheila Moulton. That's S-H-E-I-L-A-M-O-U-L-T-O-N. I apologize. I am speaking, and I didn't intend to, and so I do not have a written comment, but would just like to share some experience. I also want to make it plain that I'm speaking purely for myself. I'm affiliated with groups that work with school boards. Also, I serve on the state charter school authority, so again, spe specifically for myself. Just some observations as I sat in on this meeting, and I have watched many meetings having to do with this topic, and I appreciate the discussion. First of all, let me mention that uh, for 12 years I served as a CCSD trustee from the years 1998 to 2010, so I do have some experience in this and I, uh, several of you on the committee do know me and have worked with me, and I appreciate the discussion that's taking place. Just some notes. First of all, in the Clark County School District, currently, I believe it was back when I was there and they still have it, uh, the trustees have access to an audit committee made up of community members, bond oversight committee, a zoning committee, a sex education committee, and maybe many others. My second point is that as I have worked with charter schools, it was interesting that when the charter school authority came back, came forward in about the year 2010, that as boards were made up there, it was prescribed to them by statute that there will be that there would be someone from the board that had legal experience, finance committee uh, experience, HR experience, education, and parent. I think it's great that they have that diversity. Just a third point that I would like to make is that I think it would be very hard to have someone as an advisor and give their all, as a trustee does, without any compensation, and I'll tell you why. When I served, it was always 20 to 40 hours a week, and back then we didn't even get the 9,000 a year. The fourth point I make, and I thought it was brought forward by your committee members, is a lot of the challenges are personality related. And I was excited to see that training, uh, more training, for them, professionalism, and one thought I have is that boards would have the opportunity or uh, to uh, actually censor or deal with rogue board members. So this concludes my testimony, and again, I thank you all for having this discussion, and I am in uh, neutral on this bill. Thank you, Ms. Moulton. I don't see anyone else there in Las Vegas to testify, so we'll go to go to the phones. BPS, is there anyone on the phone calling in to testify neutral for Assembly Bill 175? To give neutral testimony on AB 175, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you. Um, to the members of sponsors and the, and the committee for caring about public education. This is Chris Giancaliani, G-I-U-N-C-H-I-G-L-I-A-N-I. 
I'm calling in in neutral because I'm trying to still figure out what any of the bills, uh, whether it's hybrid, appointed, advisory, will do to affect student outcomes. Um, I think Ms. Moulton, and I, I've known her for many years, kind of summed it up to some extent. We have all sorts of boards and commissions, but over the years, even since Ms. Moulton uh, uh, served, the policies have changed from a policy of governance to what they call balanced. And what's taken away is the voice of the trustees to actually weigh in on everything, and therefore they're the ones blamed. We have to look at the personalities, unfortunately. Some superintendents are great, but some have a leadership style that pit people against each other. And unfortunately, that's some of what's happened down in Clark. But that's not go this is not going to fix the problem. And so we make need to make sure we are identify what the problem is. In the long run, they're underpaid. They should be paid a salary. If you have an outside employment, there's different models that are out there. And I'm saying anywhere from thirty to 60000 a year, depending on um, uh, the size of the district. You could do a hybrid model and put a retired teacher, a retired principal, and someone appointed by the Chamber of Commerce onto it. We should have a voice of a student. There are other ways and models to look at this, but I don't want to pit or assume that all trustees don't care. They do very strongly. Either way, it's the most thankless job out there. But simply putting a bunch of county commissioner or city council appointees on, I don't believe will benefit and, and do what you're trying to accomplish. There are ways to look at training, although the trustees and state statute are the only ones still as an elected body that even have required training, and I believe it's six hours within their first year of, terming, of term of serving. It's not just about tra training. Training can be a cover-up for what's going on. We have to find a way to make sure that parents' voices, students' voices, and others are listened to in the districts that they come from Otherwise, you're not going to fix anything if you simply go into this model. I would be happy to work with you on some hybrid ideas if that's the direction you want to go in. That's not necessarily my preference, but um, I do think there's ways to accomplish it where we don't lose the voice of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. That that sounded a little more like opposition than, than neutral. So if if it's uh, appropriate with to the chair, I think we should put that in that. Category seems that way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that's kind of weird, huh? But, <laughs> but but thank you. Anyone else? BPS on the phone lines to uh, testify neutral on Assembly Bill 175. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is Anna Binder for the record. A N N A B I N D E R. Um, I'm not sure. I know I'm definitely not in um, support of this. We defeated this measure in the last legislative session for very good reasons. Um, I, I want to express that I have spent in the last couple of years countless hours as a very invested parent in trying to communicate and trying to fix things and amongst other community members. And our hugest issue is that balanced governance. Um, I can very easily go back and map just from 2019 forward how the balanced governance has taken away all of the oversight of the trustees. I am also an audit advisory committee member for Clark County School District as well as on the attendance zone advisory committee and those committees are district ran. They are not trustee ran. Um, so what good do they really do if um, you know, the, if central office is running it and the superintendent and not what it's supposed to be. And I've taken effort um, on that. I, I testified more yesterday, but I spent over nine hours today compiling an email that I have forwarded to you, Madam Chair, of financial and all kinds of other things that central office does and how the current board of trustees um, allows for these things to happen. And right now I wanna vomit and I'm about to have a breakdown because it's not just about personality differences and it's not just about who's sitting on that board. It is central office, it is the superintendent, and it is everyone who works in the offices of Clark County School District that allow a perpetuation of generational problems. And we always have an opportunity to be bold 
and do what is right. And instead, we just keep talking about it. We need to do what needs to be done. And if that winds up being an appointed board in some way, shape, or form, then great. I am an invested parent who is willing to run with no pay, and I will invest my whole life in it to make it better. But I can't say the same about other trustees that even currently sit. Thank you. Thank you, caller. BPS, do we have any other callers? It was kind of a balance. Kind of, so we left, we left it neutral. We were having it was kind of a balance. BPS, are there any other callers and in, in, uh, testify for, to testify for neutral? We are on neutral testimony for AB 175. If you've just recently joined the call and would like to testify in neutral, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers wishing to provide neutral testimony at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. We're gonna invite our chair and Assemblyman Urich back to the table for any closing comments or remarks you'd like to share. Thank you, Vice Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, Toby Urich. Um, we are truly grateful um, for everybody that took the time to come in and speak on this important issue today. Um, I want to reiterate, I think that everybody who is opining in on this is come with a heart to help our students. Um, and to be sure, we look forward. I was talking with uh, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. Uh, we look forward to continued discussions and to working with all of our stakeholders to find solutions that will improve student outcomes. Um, one comment I heard uh, today, it made me want to reiterate that this bill is not about disruption. It's about discussion. And it's what I said earlier, I firmly believe that democracy best flourishes when there are more voices that can be heard. We believe that AB 175 as amended is a solution that addresses the legitimate concerns related to our school boards. While not altering the landscape of a conventional school board or inhibiting the democratic process that is essential to representation, it does add another layer of insight, expertise, and experience that we believe can contribute to the issues that our school board must address. Thank you. Thank you. Everything my colleague said, and then I would like to add that I just want to remind uh, Shannon Bilber Axrod for the record this bill is about giving school board members resources and expertise to help them do their job. Um, I know it's come up that uh, in testimony that they. They were already CFOs and lawyers, but remember those CFOs, those lawyers, they work for the district. So another thing that came up was that this bill dilutes the votes of elected members. Only elected members are voting. Once again, the intent of this bill is giving members the resources and expertise to help them do their jobs better. Um, Someone came up in opposition and said that the city, the cities or the county might won't take their appointments seriously. I, I have a big problem with that. Um, I think they will take those appointments very seriously because these are our kids. Uh, I'll end with I am very proud of this legislation, this bipartisan legislation. As a mom, as a legislator, as a chair of the education committee. We can't keep doing what we're doing. I urge you to support AB 175. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Assemblyman Urich. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 175 and, we'll th and thank everyone who came out to uh, share their comments or concerns, who showed up in, in Las Vegas and who phoned in um, to, uh, to weigh in on this very important issue. And I'm now going to turn the gavel back over to Chair Bilbrey Axelrod. Thank you, Vice Chair Taylor. And we are now into our final thing, which is public comment. I will remind people that public comment, you have two members have two minutes for those wishing to provide public comment. 
Um, you can do it either in person in Carson City, in person in Las Vegas, or telephonically. And the information on how to call in is on today's agenda posted on Nellis. Each person, as I said, has two minutes. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name for the record. See quite a few people coming up for public comment here in Carson City, so that is where we will begin. Please begin when you're ready. Hi, Patricia Haddad, uh, P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-H-A-D-D-A-D, -A -A -D, Director of Government Relations for Clark County School District, also went to Clark County School District schools from third through 12th grade. Um, I'm purposefully um, coming to you under public comment uh, to discuss, and I wanted to provide some quick clarifications um, based on some questions that came up. So uh, I did want to clarify, uh, we were at just under $3.1 billion last fiscal year for the uh, uh, total operating budget. Um, there was another question in regards to uh, uh, collaboration and communication with the municipalities. Um, so the uh, legislation to reorganize Clark County School District, uh, NRS 388G.630 specifically requires uh, uh, quarterly in-person reports uh, to each municipality. Um, that includes information about, and, and so what we do is information uh, uh, specific to student performance, to student demographics, uh, disaggregated by that municipality. Um, and the reason that we do this is to inform collective impact strategies that the municipalities might be able to undertake in order to support the social safety net that exists that uh, uh, each child and their family is, is, is existing in and experiencing. Um, so that they can come to school ready, ready to learn, so that the school district can can take that on and, and ensure that our kids are getting educated each day. We spend a lot of time, a lot of resources, ensuring that kids have their basic needs met. And of course, educators in the room are and and support professionals are, are very uh, very well aware of of the time and, and resources that are spent on that. Um, and then the, you know the last thing I'll just add is that you know I think it's important that the legislature continues to research the data on what high functioning boards and and uh, look like and model those findings. Um, uh, if this bill moves forward uh, to ensure that we're building strong, thoughtful, sustain sustainable policy that's supportive of driving student outcomes so overall. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kaylin Evans. That's C-A-L-E-N-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm the president of the Washoe Education Association. Uh, we represent the 4,000 certified professionals in the Washoe County School District. Um, I'm here today with a group of educators as we are continuing to make sure that our voices um, are heard loud and clear throughout the legislative session. It was extremely important that I brought a group here to address this committee specifically because there is an immense amount of expertise and personal experience as educators. Um, many of you are on the ground in the trenches right now um, and you understand the immense crisis that our public education system is facing. I um, heard a lot of discussion today around um, student outcomes and the, the need to address those. I would say that um, Washoe and Clark County being currently ranked in the bottom 5% of districts funded nationally has the largest impact um, on student achievement. Um, over the last decade and a half, uh, Nevada's per pupil funding has ranked 48th. Um, in that same time, we have averaged the largest class sizes in the entire country. Um, we are absolutely in a crisis that has to be met with an immense amount of urgency and aggressiveness. Um, I will end this with the idea that we keep talking about education and we need to go beyond just the hundreds of thousands of students in our state and the tens of thousands of educators. Um, in our state and their families, because education impacts every single one of your constituents. The millions of Nevadans are directly impacted. Everything from poverty rates, crime rates, student mental health, children mental health, suicide rates, the, uh, e the economy, and the overall health of our community are directly impacted by our public education system, and we are doing a complete disservice to the millions of Nevadans if we continue to neglect our education system. So I appreciate the opportunity to address this committee today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dylan Mollendorf. I might take two minutes to spell that, but it's M-O-E-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. I am a uh, history teacher at Hug High 
in uh, Sparks, Nevada. I also have been a, uh, a teacher in uh, Wooster High School, as well as uh, I did three years in Pahrump Valley High School. So this terminology of uh, frontier is rather foreign to me. Um, actually, as a history teacher, I would like to state that in 1890, the frontier officially ended. So uh, with that being said, uh, uh, one of the concerns that I do have, we're talking about outcome. And what I have seen with the outcome in uh, Nevada is has been very bleak. Um, I've taught in rural, I've taught AP, I've taught IB. Um, and what I see is every year we have anywhere from 30 to 40 kids in a classroom. Uh, this past year, I've watched a lot of really good teachers just throw in the towel, retire, uh, have quit. I've seen uh, bad teachers continue to stay. Um, and we need to do something where we are encouraging good educators. If we want to have good outcomes, we need to encourage good educators. And by that, we need to start lowering the class size. Uh, and one way of doing that is start putting money towards uh, more teachers, smaller class sizes, and getting rid of frivolous money that would normally go to uh, maybe consultants, which I have seen for the last seven years that come in, tell you they love your community, how much it reminds them of Utah or Wyoming or New York. And then they give a big presentation with a great slideshow PowerPoint presentation, and then they leave. Uh, we need to start focusing, directing the money to smaller classes. And uh, with that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lindsay Lavely, L-A-V-E-L-Y. I'm a high school English teacher at McQueen High School, a member and a school representative for the WEA, and this is my 12th year teaching. Let's talk about the weather. It's pretty clear that everyone's tired of the snow. And now we're adding atmospheric rivers and flood warnings on top of that. We know all about this because it is everywhere we look. The news, social media posts, conversations with coworkers in passing. And you know what we do about this news? Well, after we complain about it, we prepare for it. We find ways to protect the people and the things that matter to us individually, as well as in our communities. We want the least amount of damage, so we prepare for the worst, instead of just waiting until our homes, siblings, restaurants, etc., are hurt or ruined. Now, if we do this for weather, why would we not do this for education? Why are we waiting until we have a society that has been drowned by the weight of the choice to not fund the education of our future citizens in a way that keeps us all floating? Why are the ones in the middle pulling students out of the water so overwhelmed and hurting? When do we realize where we are and that supporting teachers, support staff, and students is the way to fix this? I'm not talking about support as in, wow, you're a teacher. I can't even imagine teaching kids these days. Instead, I am talking about changing the ways in which Nevada has run educa education. We have made teachers do the same amount of work or more year after year with less and less funding. It is clearly time for 20. I am grateful to be a teacher. I've been teaching since I was in high school and probably before. I was teaching dance in surrounding middle schools. I taught reading to kindergartners in surrounding elementary schools. It was so clearly a part of who I was, but how could I actually afford to be a teacher? Two things made it possible. I was married at the age of 19, so I had a spouse to lean on financially. And two, I decided not to teach until after I earned my master's degree. This isn't quite possible for every teacher though. For example, my school has two teachers in their second and third year of teaching that have left or are leaving because they can easily get paid more in a position that has less stress and less responsibilities. That's a terrible sign for education. You are just at your two minutes. It is time for 20 if we want professionals teaching the future. It's time for 20 if we want professionals to stay in the classroom for more than five years. It is time for 20 if we don't want to have to clean up another disaster. Thank you. Good afternoon, MJ Ubano, U-B-A-N-D-O for the record. Until about eight months ago, I was an English teacher in Washoe County and a member of the Washoe Education Association. Lately, and especially today, referring to my educational career in the past tense kills me because for 10 years, being a teacher was more than a job. It was my identity, as it is for most teachers I know. The choice to leave was and is still difficult because I loved, was good at, and deeply miss working with my colleagues and my students. But I felt 
felt forced to leave because the stress of managing classes of 35, 34, 30, 40 kids devalued the quality of my teaching and my ability to provide students the individualized attention they deserved. More than once, I have given up my own desk so a student had a place to sit. I left because it meant an immediate $10,000 raise to take a mid-entry level position that I probably could have gotten shortly after I graduated with my bachelor's and definitely before I got my master's had I decided not to go into teaching. I left because in my last year of teaching, I was diagnosed with shingles at 33. And when a doctor asked what was causing me stress, all I needed to say was, I am a teacher, for her to understand. And then I got to hear about two other teachers who also got shingles, both under the age of 50. I left, but I am here today to advocate for the teachers who want to be here, but couldn't find a sub they trust or a sub at all, or are covering for another class because there is literally no one else. Or maybe they need the money that goes with sacrificing their precious prep time. They can't be here because when the bell rang this afternoon, they will work an extra three hours grading papers or preparing for tomorrow's lessons. Or maybe they will leave their classroom to drive to their second job to compensate for the lack of respect they are shown at this first one. Teachers should not have to choose between taking care of themselves or their students or their families. As a teacher who felt forced to leave herself to save herself, I am telling you that schools are drowning and desperately need life rafts, not rainy day funds. It is time for 20. It is time for you, as our elected officials, some of you who I canvassed for, to act and convince others to act. It is well past time for Nevada to take care of its educators, who are literally sacrificing their lives every day to take care of our children. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Matt Wiegand. No relation to the guy who's got his name on a building in Reno. Uh, I am a teacher. I'm a middle school teacher in Washoe County. I had this big bombastic speech ready for you guys, but I changed it last minute because my wife, who is an elementary school teacher at a very heavily impacted by poverty school in Reno, uh, she got a text message today. Uh, one of the parents is going to bring a bunch of food for her students from Costco, and she was so excited because she knows that most of her students don't have food at home. She knows that a lot of her students don't have a home to go to after school. She knows that a lot of her students are so heavily impacted by trauma that would bring most adults to their knees. Things like watching their siblings or parents die in front of them. Things like being abused physically or mentally. And she has to, you take all those kids and you put them in a kindergarten room. And then with that weight of trauma on them, you go, okay, teachers, teach them reading, writing, and math. Go. It's simply so difficult and we're drowning now. I love what I do. I got a master's degree in literacy so I could be the best middle school teacher that I could be. I love teaching kids how to read. I love watching a kid pick up a novel for the first time and finishing it all the, all the way. But I can't do my job anymore because there's simply not enough teachers for me to make an impact on every single student in my classroom. And every single student deserves a teacher that can make an impact for them. They deserve it so much more than anything else. It's so difficult to come to work every day and receive a paycheck. And I look at it and my wife sees hers and we go, oh my God, how are we going to make it to the next month? It is so difficult to come to my job and think that there are billions of dollars in a rainy day fund, and there wants to be billions more in some kind of reserve fund. And I think to myself, are we waiting for a rainy day that's of biblical proportions? Because right now, I don't know how us mere mortals can survive. I really, really wish that you guys would take up the support of the Time for 20 bill and the Respect for Teachers Act, because we desperately need your help right now. And we are trying our hardest. If you ask any teacher right now some words to describe how they feel in education, uh, they'd be very choice. But if you don't act now, I'm afraid that that last word is going to be, we're gone. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Gabe Kennedy. I've been an educator with Washoe County for four years, uh, one year as a substitute, one year as a student teacher, and then two as a classroom teacher, one in high school and one in middle school. Um, I had a speech written out, but then I walked in the room and um, well, unexpectedly, my entire career is here with me. The principal who supervised me during my student teaching is sitting behind me to my left. Lindsay Lavely, who just spoke earlier, uh, was on the hiring committee for my first job. And Kaylin Evans is the one who gave me the opportunity today 
to come and explain to you why I will no longer be a teacher. Um, I never really planned on being a teacher. I was injured while I was in the Marine Corps. And when I got out, I was offered what's called the Vocational Rehabilitation Program. Uh, luckily, my injury wasn't too bad. It just resulted in three surgeries on my left foot, which makes me a l much more lucky than some other people I was with. So with that, um, I kind of wanted a job that I enjoy. I grew up here locally. Um, I played sports here locally. I really had a great experience being a student within Washoe County, so I thought being a teacher would be just the same. Unfortunately, uh, the school system that I found coming back to was much different than the one I left not that long ago. Um, as a teacher, I've spent time finding weapons in my classroom, drugs, suicide notes. As a teacher personally, I've had things stolen from me. I've been threatened. I've had one student try to fight me in the classroom. And then what finally compelled me to come here today is just recently I had a student try to kick out my legs from behind, um, which unfortunately sprained my left ankle, which was attached to the same injury that led me to be a teacher in the first place. I'm kind of one who believes in signs, so I took that as my time to perhaps leave education. But it's not that I don't care about it. I have a son who will be starting uh, school within Washoe County in the fall. So although I won't be a teacher, and that's my choice, it's not that easy for me just to walk away. And so I come here today in the hopes that perhaps we can have a conversations about what's going on in schools, and perhaps these bills that are being proposed, specifically the Respect Educators Act, are giving some serious consideration because I think it would be a good step moving forward to improve the culture of our schools and bring them back to um, really the ones I experienced growing up here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone in Las Vegas? Looks like the room has cleared. Um, anyone else up at Carson City? BPS phone lines? You provide public comment, press star nine now on your phone to take your place in the queue. Here, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers wishing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you, BPS. Okay, with that, um, we are on our last thing, which is adjournment. Our next meeting will be back in our normal room on Tuesday, March 14th at 1.30. That concludes our meeting for the day, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>